seems that there are always so very many reasons for us to be in prayer. And as a church community um, here at Harrisburg, we have had so many new concerns coming up for us. People in our church community who are struggling, suffering of body, mind, or spirit, um, facing new diagnoses um, that are challenging to them on any number of levels. And it's hard. Uh, we were reflecting on that this week. You know, normally um, on a Sunday morning, you would just walk across the pew and you would um, ask somebody how they were doing, how that procedure went, or how that new medication was working, or how they were doing, how they were feeling. Um, and we can't do those things. So all the more reason, number one, to pray for one another, but number two, here's what I want to encourage you to do, to turn your prayers into action. I want to encourage you to think about the people that you would be looking for on a Sunday morning, people that have come across the prayer chain, people that you would want to check in on, and that normally you would be able to do something as easy as just turn around in your pew. I hope that you will take the extra effort this week to reach beyond that, to call someone, um, to reach out to them, to send a note, to send a card, um, to do those things, those touches um, that we would normally do on a Sunday morning in a more intentional way um, while we are in this season of physical distancing from one another. So you can be physically distant and still close in spirit and close in heart, and we hope that you all will do that and reach out for those opportunities. There are so many in our church that need your love and care, um, and if you are one of those, I hope you know that you are loved and that we care for you and that you are not alone. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Mighty and gracious God, for the opportunity to worship you, we are so very grateful. For the gift of modern technology that has these many months allowed us and enabled us to gather together while not physically present with one another, to do so in spirit. And to know that while we are sitting in our living room watching our TV, the person that normally sits beside us or behind us or across the room from us is sitting in their house watching the same thing. We are reminded, God, that we are still bound together by the Holy Spirit that dwells and lives within our worship and within our praise, within our very hearts. And while, God, we confess to you that we miss the physical presence of one another, and the passing of the peace, and those conversations that we could have with one another in this space. We are grateful for the ways that you are teaching us a different way to love one another well. We are grateful, Lord, for the call that you put upon us to reach out that requires a little bit more effort of us and not just on Sunday morning. We pray, God, that you would help us to learn those new practices that help us more faithfully love the body of Christ. Lord, we thank you for all the folks that have been helping with our AV and our sound and uh, making sure that we can be connected in this way, and we're thankful for the gift of this modern technology that we wouldn't have had many years ago. Lord, we thank you for the church, and we thank you for her work and for her ministry that reaches out to all of our community. And we thank you, God, for those people who have encountered you um, in a new way through our worship. And we pray, God, that you will continue to dwell richly within all of our hearts. Today, God, we pray for the poor and the hungry and the neglected all over the world. We pray, God, that their cries for daily bread may inspire works of compassion and mercy among those to whom much has been given for the work of our own crisis assistance ministry, for those hands that feed those who are hungry, for schools that continue to make food that is given out and helping to feed the hungry children in our own community, for those who are in hospital alone, those who are in nursing homes, unable to receive visitors. We pray, God, that you will remind us daily to hear that cry and to reach out in love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, God, for teachers who are going back to school tomorrow and doing it in a way that is not ideal and not perfect and not what any of us would want, and yet what is called upon in this time. So, God, we pray for innovation and for creativity and for patience, 
for courage and for new insights. We pray, God, for patience with um, staff and with tech um, help, and we ask, God, that you will bless all of them with your courage and with your presence and with your peace. As they think about the new little faces and grown-up faces that they will encounter in the days and weeks to come, and we pray, God, that the bonds may be great. We pray, God, for schools and for centers of learning all over the world. We pray for those who lack access to basic education, and for the light of knowledge to blossom and shine in the lives of all God's people. We pray, God, for an end to the divisions and inequalities that scar God's creation. We pray particularly as it relates to barriers to freedom faced by God's children throughout the world because of gender. We pray, God, that all who have been formed in God's image might have the equality in pursuit of the blessing of your creation. We pray, Lord, for the health of women and children and families around the world, especially for an end to maternal and child mortality, particularly, Lord, when it disproportionately affects one group of people over another. We pray, God, that in building healthy families, all God's people may be empowered to strengthen their communities, to repair the breaches which divide nations and peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, God, for an end to pandemic disease throughout the world. We pray for a vaccine. We pray for medical professionals who work so tirelessly. We pray for researchers who are working diligently We thank you, God, for the gift of knowledge and the gift of science that teaches us so much and that has so much promise that might help us with an end to this pandemic. We pray, God, not only for the pandemic of coronavirus, but also for the scourge of HIV and AIDS and malaria and tuberculosis, that plagues plagues of death may no longer fuel poverty and destabilize nations, and inhibit reconciliation and restoration throughout the world. We pray, God, for an end to the waste and desecration of God's creation, for access to the fruits of creation to be shared equally among all people, for the communities and nations to find sustenance in the fruits of the earth and the water that you have given to us. We pray, God, for mothers and fathers who walk miles for clean water when we walk mere steps. May we never take it for granted and may we be advocates for a better world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all nations and people who already enjoy the abundance of creation and the blessings of prosperity, that our hearts may be lifted to the needs of the poor and the afflicted, and partnerships between rich and poor may occur for the reconciliation of the world that the world may grow and flourish. We pray for the sick. Pray for those who battle cancer, for those who battle in silence, for those who battle alone, they feel. We pray for those who are sick with diseases that don't have answers right now and who wait for those answers. We praise for those who walk in the valley of the shadow of death, and we pray, God, for your spirit. We pray, Lord, for those who undergo treatment of any kind. We ask, God, for your healing touch to be upon them. We pray, God, for those who battle anxiety and depression and hopelessness in this season. We ask, God, for reminders to them of your presence and hope that what is today will not be forever. We pray, God that you would ease those anxieties and that you would restore breath, restore light, and restore hope. For mental health professionals who work tirelessly to help those who are in need, we pray, God, for wisdom and guidance. And, Lord, we pray that when we are in need, we would not forget the love and the grace and the peace of God that goes with us always. When we are not the one in need, Lord, may we not forget those who are. Lay them heavy on our heart, that we may be your hands and feet and the means by which you answer prayers. We ask this all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray together. 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me this morning in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading today comes from Exodus chapter 1. We're going to be doing this month of August a, uh, a reading of the a study on Moses. And the lessons that we can learn from the defining moments in the life of this greatest leader in the Old Testament. So we're going to start today at the very beginning of the book of Exodus. And I will remind you, um, for just as your quick catch up on, uh, on the Bible and history, okay? So you remember that uh, God called Abraham and Abraham had a son. Um, 
named Isaac. And Isaac had a son named Jacob who um, became Israel. And he had 12 children, one of whom um, was Joseph. And you remember the story of how Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, uh, which was probably not the best call any brother or ever made. Um, but God used that to do a great thing. And um, so Joseph ended up in Egypt. And uh, when a famine came in the land of Israel, his brothers came to Egypt, and um, he took care of them there after they reconciled with one another. So that's how God's people ended up in Egypt, which is where we find them at the beginning of the book of Exodus. So this is Exodus chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 8 and read through verse 22. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous, more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and, in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Sipra and the other Puah, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because of the midwives feared God, he gave them families. And Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews shall be thrown into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the living word. Let us um, stand as you feel able, or if you want to remain sitting where you are, we're going to sing a song, 130 in the hymn book, called God Will Take Care of You. Think about how those mothers must have felt um, if their children were taken from them, particularly as we begin to read the story of Moses in just a moment and hear how his mother put him on the Nile with a simple prayer that God would take care of him. Let's sing together about how God does all that for us.
Amen. You may be seated. Our second reading this morning uh, continues the opening of Exodus um, as we read the first um, ten verses of chapter 2. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took uh, as his wife a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. It continues. And when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds at the river's brink. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to fetch it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and lo, the babe was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses. For she said, Because I drew him out of the water. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as Tony Ruth said, over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at key moments in Moses' story. Moments of crisis and decision, moments of confrontation and revelation, moments that defined not only Moses' life, but the life of the people of Israel. And these moments have re reverberations through all of, of human history. In other words, this is important stuff. And as we look at these moments, we'll see faithfulness in the face of fear, We'll see courageous leadership. We'll see disappointment and struggle. And we'll see trust in God's liberating power in the face of oppression. We'll also have the opportunity to learn about Moses' identity, to learn about the identity of the people of Israel, to learn about God's identity and even our own. These moments can help us understand ourselves, and the God that we worship and serve. The book of Exodus, um, like any scripture, has power. And there's some uh, resonance, I think, in, in Exodus in the history of our own country. In the history of where we live. Um, <laughs> Exodus is a uh, potentially controversial book and uh, we can see that in our own history here in the state of North Carolina the first anti-literacy uh, bill uh, for slaves was introduced in 1818 and it was strengthened um, in 1830 and the, the uh, anti-literacy for slaves the, that bill and from 1830 reads, Whereas the teaching of slaves to read and write has a tendency to excite dissatisfaction in their minds and to produce insurrection and rebellion to the manifest injury of the citizens of the state. Therefore, be it enacted by the General Assembly of the state of North Carolina, and it is hereby enacted by the authority of the same that any free person who shall hereafter teach or attempt to teach any slave within this state to read or write, the use of figures accepted, shall be liable to indictment in any court of record in the state 
having jurisdiction thereof. And upon conviction shall at the discretion of the court, if a white man or woman be fined not less than 100, not more than $200, or imprisoned, and if a free person of color shall be whipped at the discretion of the court, not exceeding 39 lashes, nor less than 20 lashes. Be it further enacted that if any slave shall hereafter teach or attempt to teach any other slave to read or write, he or she may be carried before any justice of the peace, and on conviction thereof shall be sentenced to receive 39 lashes on his or her bare back. Another bill introduced in 1831 made it illegal for slaves and free people of color to preach or exhort in public or in any manner to officiate as a preacher or teacher in any prayer meeting or other association for worship where slaves of different families are collected together. So on our books in the state of North Carolina in the 1830s, the law states that slaves cannot be taught to read or write. A year later, slaves, no person of color, free or slave, can lead, uh, teach, or preach any gathering from different families of slaves. And uh, there's a reason why that's not there in the law. Um, but the most uh, common book, a book everyone had in their home, was a Bible. And if you're going to teach someone to read, that's typically one of the things you would teach them. They use the Bible to teach them to read. And the problem is if you teach somebody to read and you have a Bible there, the second book of the Bible is about a slave insurrection and about freeing slaves from an evil power. So instead of maybe... Uh, Understanding that the second book of Scripture, the book of Exodus, really talks about the evils of slavery, people in our country, our ancestors, decided it was better that they shouldn't read. There are echoes of our history in the history of the ancient Hebrew people that we see this morning. And so there's power in this word. There was power when this happened with Moses and the Hebrew people, power throughout the history of the church, and power in the 1830s. There's still power in this Word of God to challenge us, to transform us, even to scandalize us. So in these moments of the life of Moses, what we see is the power of God at work, and we see the power of faithfulness. And we start, not surprisingly, at the beginning. We're told that a new regime has been established in Egypt. The new king didn't know anything about Joseph or Joseph's people. It's a new king and a new situation, a perilous moment. Now, for their part, the Hebrew people are flourishing. They're growing in number. And that inspires fear in the new Pharaoh. And what if they keep growing? And what if they join our enemies to defeat us? And so that's the crisis at the start of Exodus. The enslavement and brutal oppression of the Hebrew people. And it starts with a hypothetical problem. A what-if scenario concocted in the fearful and paranoid imagination of this new king. Now the Hebrew people, they reflect God's initial command to humanity, be fruitful and multiply. But the forces of death are close at hand. And they're seeking to thwart God's purposes and destroy God's people. And so with this setup, we might expect God to dramatically intervene with power and vengeance. Maybe thinking back to Noah and the flood, or even Sodom and Gomorrah, but no, God's involvement, at least in the early part of, of the story of Exodus, is subtle. Now that's going to change soon enough, but in the scripture we read, God's involvement is subtle. It's closer um, to the stories of Joseph or Ruth or Esther. You know, in, in those stories, God is barely mentioned. In the book of Esther, God is not named at all. 
but God is at work. And it's in the background, mostly hidden, except to the eyes of faith. Now this might be encouraging for us. Maybe we want the thundering God, the God of unmistakable action and unambiguous intervention. We want drama and power free of doubt. most of the time in our lives, God's work is subtle, more in the background, mostly hidden except to the eyes of faith. The story can give us insight into the God we serve, insights that might surprise us, challenge us, maybe even make us a little uncomfortable or upset. kind of God's M.O. in Scripture to make some surprising choices, to choose surprising people to accomplish His purposes. The beginning of Exodus is no different. And reading this story closely, what you notice is that there's a lot of kind of irony, there's a lot of reversals, kind of a lot of our expectations of, of what should happen is kind of subverted and overturned Pharaoh commands Hebrew, uh, male Hebrew children to be killed, but it's Hebrew women who thwart Pharaoh's plans. And not just Hebrew women, but Hebrew midwives. So the very people who are on the bottom of the social ladder in Egypt are the ones to frustrate Pharaoh's plans. Pharaoh commands the Egyptian people to throw male Hebrew infants into the Nile so that they would drown. The same river that is the means to rescue Moses. The one who will lead God's people to freedom through the water is himself drawn out of the water, rescued by Pharaoh's daughter. And finally, the very one, Moses, who will, a few chapters later, make a dramatic entrance into the courts of Pharaoh to challenge Pharaoh in the name of God. Moses is raised and taught to be a leader in the very court of Pharaoh, basically as Pharaoh's grandson. God works through people who have no obvious power and no evident worldly advantage. Paul tells us as much in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, Paul says. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one, not even Pharaoh, might boast in the presence of God. So God chooses surprising people. Now if we sit with that idea long enough, it might start to bother us. It might make us a little uncomfortable to think that God chooses, that God has preferences when it comes to people. We try to wriggle out of that, which is evident in Scripture, That God has preferences. We might try to wriggle out of that. Um, Now, God loves everybody, right? God loves all people. You know, all lives matter, right? Uh, Well, we read Exodus and we learn something about this God that we serve. God has preferences. And I think part of our problem is that we struggle. To understand God's identity. And I think we've been given two kind of pictures of God or two understandings of God, and we work to combine those two, and at the end of the day, it just doesn't work, it doesn't fit. Sometimes it's like we want to combine the God of Scripture, the God we read about in Exodus, the prophets, the God revealed in Jesus Christ. We want to combine that. God, our God, the God we serve, with the God of the philosophers. 
What I mean by that is so often we assume that God is defined by or bound by logical rules. That God is predictable and utterly consistent, even mechanical. Now that's a more Greek understanding of God, more philosophical. That God is cold and distant and unfeeling. That's not the God we encounter in the Bible. That's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, Moses, or David and Paul. That's not the God revealed in Jesus Christ, and it's not the God of Exodus. This God feels, there's emotion. This God is in relationship. This God is close, not far away, not distant. This God is not bound by our understanding of logic. Certainly, if you read the Old Testament and then move into the Gospels, this God is not predictable. Certainly, this God, our God, is not impressed by human power or human wealth or human accomplishment. The God we encounter in Scripture is a God that takes sides. Our God chooses the liberation of of oppressed people. And that begins in this first moment. Let's be clear, in the struggle between good and evil, God takes sides. In the struggle between life and death, God takes sides. In the struggle between liberation and oppression, God takes sides. Between justice and injustice, God takes sides. Between the powerful and the powerless, God takes sides. When it comes to exploitation, injustice, and oppression, God takes sides. If that makes us uncomfortable or angry, maybe the Holy Spirit is leading us to reflect which side we're on. God is at work to liberate us from fear, from hatred, and whatever forms they present themselves. Shifra and Phua, Moses' mother and his sister, these midwives and these, these women are examples to us. Ordinary people, not wealthy or powerful, not even noticed by the wealthy and powerful, showing us the power of faithfulness in the face of oppression. Showing us how God works through what is ordinary, even overlooked, to accomplish God's purposes. Or Pharaoh's daughter, showing us how to act with compassion and courage in the face of Pharaoh's power and fear. Moses was drawn out of the very water that was intended to kill him, rescued by ordinary, courageous people who are motivated by faithfulness in the face of fear, working for liberation and justice in the face of oppression, trusting in God's power, even when Pharaoh's power seemed overwhelming and total. That same God is still at work in our world. God still takes the side of the hurting, the oppressed, the forgotten, and the poor. And I pray that we would have the same courage faithfulness and trust in God's power in our time, in our community, even when the forces of oppression and evil seem daunting and powerful. May we put our whole trust in God's grace and power, confident in God's steadfast love and faithfulness. And just like Moses' sister laid him in the basket and cast him out into the Nile, just like Pharaoh's daughter drew him from the water and lifted him out of the basket, setting him on a journey, full of struggle, marked by faithfulness, leading to liberation. May we have that same trust and faithfulness. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God, the challenges we face in our lives, in our communities, in our nation can seem so overwhelming. God, we are, find ourselves in a 
time of fear and anxiety. We've got a time when it's so easy to draw dividing lines, to point fingers of blame. When it's so easy to be selfish. When it's so easy to God to make scapegoats out of people who are different from us. Remind us, God, that our citizenship is in heaven. Remind us, God, that we are not to be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, help us to be on whatever side you're on, to not be in opposition to you, to not get in your way. But use us, God, like the Hebrew midwives. God, even like the Pharaoh's daughter, use us for the sake of reconciliation, for the sake of justice, for the sake of salvation. God, help us to be faithful. To not be dominated by greed or fear, but to put all of our trust in you. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We uh, continue to give thanks for all that God has given that is so rich in generosity and in kindness to us. We uh, know that you are grateful for all of those things as well. And for the offering of um, your time and your service and your giftedness and your prayers. And um, those offerings that you drop in the mail or that you give online, we continue to give thanks. Um, and we pray that God would bless all that giving to his glory. I continue to remind you to take a drive by. You can do that safely. Drive by the church and see all that's going on here in our church building and um, give thanks for God's faithfulness to us and give thanks for what God is doing. And while you do that, pray. Um, pray for the building team as they continue to make decisions along the way. Pray for our project manager, uh, Joel Gilland, who is working for us um, tirelessly. Pray for the folks at Myers and Chapman. Um, and particularly uh, Ro, who uh, uh, is here every day, uh, and, and every time I see him, asks me to, to remember him in prayer um, and to pray for the safety of those who are working here. Um, so we pray for him, and we pray for all those who uh, contractors and subcontractors that are on our property, that not only will they be kept safe, but that they might encounter the Spirit of God um, as they work on our, on our building, on our sanctuary, on this house of God. So um, I would encourage you um, to continue to be about the work of prayer and thank you for your generosity and giving that supports the work of ministry. I would remind you that you can drop that offering in um, the mail to P.O. Box 970 in Harrisburg or uh, you can do that online. There is a link here in the comment section for you to do that. And we give thanks for all of God's faithfulness and generosity. As you think about giving your gift, one of the things that we do here at uh, at Harrisburg United Methodist in our 11 o'clock worship is after we receive our offering we all stand and we sing what is known as a doxology which is a song of praise and so wherever you are I want you to stand and let's sing together a doxology as we offer ourselves and our gifts to God In our baptismal vows, we answer the question, um, do you accept the freedom and the power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Sometimes we think that we are resisting evil, injustice, and oppression by ourselves, and we feel weak, and so we don't. 
But the midwives and Pharaoh did not face injustice and oppression, and neither did Moses alone. They did it with the help of God. The song we're getting ready to sing is called God of Grace and God of Glory, and it's an invitation for God to pour out his power on us that we might be empowered to be his instruments in the world to serve and to love and to give. So we hope that you will hear this as a prayer that God might give you the power to do what he calls you to do. Let's sing together. Just a few announcements this week. Um, Children's Connect will meet with Pastor Richard at 1130. Uh, all children that are in preschool through the fourth grade are invited to jump on Zoom with Pastor Richard. Uh, youth, I would remind you that tonight's youth group um, is going to be online on Zoom, and so we encourage you to jump online for youth group at 5 o'clock. Um, and then tonight at 8 o'clock, we are having a service of prayer and communion here at the church. Um, there are a few spots left on the registration. If you want to be one of the 25 people that is um, outside gathered um, to, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, um, if you are not able to register or you are not comfortable um, being um, outside together, uh, you may come and park in the parking lot for that service, um, and we will bring communion to you. Um, and if you want to drive by at 830, um, and, and receive the Lord's Supper, you are invited to do so. I would remind you, please, when you're on church property, either when you are here doing the 20, at one of the 25, or um, if you are in your car tonight to receive, please, we encourage you to wear masks. Um, we also ask that you social distance um, and do that physical distancing and honor that with one another. It's so tempting. We want to hug our friends, and we understand that, that impulse in you, but we want to remind you that we are still in a time that it is best practice for us to wear masks, to physically distance, and to wash our hands. We will also have hand sanitizer here as well. So I hope that you will come and receive the Lord's Supper tonight, um, and we're going to do that as safely as we can possibly do so. Um, do you have any other announcements? Yes. Um, uh, a word went out, and uh, there's a slide that um, we were showing earlier for announcements about the upcoming 
a book we're going to be reading for our theology fight club group. And uh, the announcement, I believe, said 9 a.m. We will not be meeting at 9 a.m., but 9 p.m., uh, starting Monday, August 17th. So 9 o'clock um, in the evening. All right. That's all the announcements that we have today, but we are so glad that you joined us for worship. And um, we are grateful for the continued generosity of you to be present with us. Thank you for joining us. Let us go now with this benediction. May we be on God's side, joining in the work that God is already doing in our world. May we go in the strength of God, the grace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ, the peace and power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.